Doing All right. right, we are live on Facebook and LinkedIn mm -hmm. talking about Q&A with College Disability Services. And our College Disability Services folks should be on momentarily. We're here just a few minutes early to get set up and get invite our audience in. I'm not going to record yet, but uh, hopefully we will be able to record this. Actually, <clears throat> this is recorded. Um, oh, here we go. People are coming in. We've got someone from Wisconsin. Hi, folks. Um, oh, we've got one of our another panelists joining. We are being recorded. Um, hi, Kirsten. Hello. How are you? Good. Good. Welcome. We're on a few minutes early, and it uh, looks like some of the viewers are joining a few minutes early, too. So we are being recorded, just so you know. Uh, we've got someone from Wayne from New York, uh, someone from Wisconsin. And our other panelists will be here momentarily. Love to know uh, where folks uh, are from and uh, also tell us if you have kids in high school or college. Uh, Debbie in Orlando, great. Oh, Kelsey's here too. Welcome, Kelsey. Hello. Hello. So, um, if you haven't put your name on, feel free to enter your name. We are here again talking about Q&A with College Disability Services. We've already got staff from two colleges here. When you respond to a question, feel free to identify. Well, Kelsey, we can see you're with Agnes Scott College. <laughs> <laughs> but Kirsten, uh, if you want to edit your name to put Tufts University on there, you can, or um, you can just let people know I'm Kirsten from Tufts University. Um, and let's see, we've got um, Tom, disability rights attorney. And Lisa from Georgia. Uh, I know that Georgian, one of our panelists is from Georgia. So again, we welcome questions from for our panelists. Anything you want to know about college uh, disability services in college, tell us your top concerns about your child in college if you have one uh, or a child going to college. Um, why don't we start off with some general conversation about preparing for college. So uh, any of the panelists, you want to give us some general overview for high school students with disabilities. What should they be doing now in preparation for seeking accommodations college later? Hi, Allison. Uh, just put a question up. What should high school students with disabilities be doing now in preparation for seeking accommodations in college. And view is 
welcome to join to jump in. I'll kick it if off. You're not, um, if folks who aren't speaking, you might want to mute. I am hearing some background or whoever that's coming from. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a really great question and something that I'm I'm glad that you're raising and that we can start to think about um, now. So any high school student who is, um, you know, really at any point in their high school experience at this point, um, wants to be included in the IEP or the 504 process as best as possible, um, meaning that they should have a, a good understanding about the nature of their disability, what the diagnosis is, but more importantly, we want them to understand how it impacts various academic uh, ex various academic experiences as well as non-academic experiences. So if you're, if you're thinking about going away to college, some thoughts might be, you know, what does it look like for independent living? Um, what are some, you know, areas where my disability impacts that specific thing? The other thing too with academic, the academic space, if you will, is it would be helpful for students to have a better understanding of what supports are helpful to them, what supports maybe are a bit redundant, and what supports <clears throat> formal or informal really have helped them to get to where they need to be. So a lot of times students are provided with accommodations through their IEP or their 504 plan, but in other situations, students are informally accommodated. Maybe a teacher lets them stay a little late, or turn their assignment in a little late, or maybe, um, you know, an absence is forgiven here and there. So really getting it, getting the student a chance to think about what it is that helps them to succeed. Is there a specific type of assistive technology that's really helpful? Um, is there a certain way of communicating that's really helpful? Getting to know not only their disability, but what it is that's been helpful for them. Because these are questions that the disability service provider is going to be asking about their experiences from their, their point of view. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything to that? And remember to unmute. Go ahead, Allison. I want to echo what Kirsten is saying. It's so important for students to have an understanding of their own disability or constellation of disabilities and to be able to speak to it. Um, as Kirsten said, disability services offices are going to really begin with their narrative and ask them to explain and discuss what their experience was in high school. So I think I probably say this several times throughout the night, but self-advocacy and independence is such an important thing that parents can help their students begin working on right now uh, and it's something that's really going to help facilitate their experience in college including beginning with the interactive process as they navigate the beginning steps of um oh my own face uh the, <laughs> the beginning steps of receiving accommodations in college if i can um echo as well as a um, just from a school counselor lens that that self-advocacy piece is something i really 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 believe in um, and knowing, because so much of the, I'm sure you guys can attest to the, the college experience is knowing how to independently broker those relationships on your own because you don't have that counselor coming in, making sure that you have accommodations so they have to know and have that confidence in themselves, knowing their disability, know how to advocate for themselves on a college campus and do it pretty successfully because it is a huge shift um, <laughs> from, I hate to use this word, but from the coddling that we do as counselors in the high school setting to college where they're totally independent. I would also add thinking beyond just accommodations um, and that particular transition, um, just more broad skill sets that someone might need for really any transition in their life, but particularly thinking about leaving high school into college. Prior to my work at Agnes Scott, I was at the Emory Autism Center and we did a lot of work around supporting um, students, particularly with autism and transition. And we sort of identified four different key skill sets that we thought were really helpful to be working on in high school to really set you up for success once you're off in a more independent space. And those were social skills, self-awareness skills, which a lot of people have brought up self-advocacy, which is very important. But I think self-awareness can be sort of a precursor to that and knowing what you're good at, what's hard for you, how does your diagnosis work? That really starts with um, some self-awareness. Also executive functioning skills and some basic daily adult living skills. So also, you know, you want to be preparing for, you know, academic accommodations and that sort of thing. But what are 
broader skill sets that you can be thinking about and working on at home and in school uh, before you graduate as well. So I don't know if folks saw, there was a question that came in. Um, I'm going to post the question. Uh, there. Any resources for blind or visually impaired for an accessible implicit bias tool? Anybody know of accessible implicit bias tools, particularly for people who are blind or visually impaired? I, I don't have any thoughts on that. If nobody wants to respond, I'll go ahead, Allison. I'm sorry, Eric. I, I don't know um, if I'm answering correctly. I, I'm not sure um, if my response has anything to do with implicit bias, but a new tool that we are attempting to pilot um, on our campus and just beginning to try it out is uh, ERA, uh, or uh, pardon me, it's IRA, A-I-R-A. And it's visual information from highly trained agents anytime, anywhere. You can download it onto your phone and walk through campus and have a live agent tell you, um, turn to the left, there's um, a sign here, et cetera. So I'm not sure if that answers the first part of the question, but it is a, a new tool for visually impaired uh, students and, and employees uh, or just people. Um, there's a question whether the video will be available for download to use as a reference. And uh, this is being recorded. And uh, I hope to post the recording uh, as soon as I have access to it. Uh, here's another question that came in. What about tips for self-advocating adults trying to re-enter college or start college? Uh, of course, not all college students came straight out of high school. I can, I can lead off and then and sure. turn it over to my colleagues. But this is a really great question. And we're seeing a lot of um, quote unquote non-traditional students coming out of the COVID experience. And um, <clears throat> just even prior to that with the economy shifting so and so much. So I think one of the things that we can talk about with adults who are coming back is one is we want to encourage them to find the disability office on their campus because um, we are the people who can start to dig through your history um, and help figure out what accommodations might make sense. From sort of a self-advocacy advocacy standpoint, knowing about how you learn, how you navigate your day-to-day -day responsibilities, whether they be at a job or um, you know, within even within your family, there's there's tools and strategies within those experiences that we can pull out and apply to the, the classroom and beyond in a collegiate experience. Um, so definitely finding the disability office is the first thing I would I would consider. The other thing too, a lot of times it's a, it's a difficult shift for, stu for students coming back to school after having been out for a little while in terms of some executive functioning management. So this is an opportunity to rethink scheduling. What does that look like? How are you going to balance life with um, a collegiate experience that's very different than it might be for a more traditional age students who that's their sole, sole focus. Um, and there was one more thing that I had, but I think it's I've forgotten it at, at this particular moment in time. But reach out. Let's talk about you know what we can make, how we can support you in your individual needs. Um, but really being cognizant of the fact that you know you're navigating a bunch of different things, life experiences, and so forth that may very much um, direct what what resources are appropriate. Great. Um, somebody else want to add to that? Go ahead, Allison. I would also add to review their documentation and see what they have that is current. Um, guidelines for documentation being current tend to be three years. I think that's the national model, occasionally five years, um, and begin to put their ducks in a row in terms of uh, documentation that is timely. Uh, so, of course, we know that documentation requirements depend on the nature of the disability. It may be as simple as uh, returning to a therapist, returning to a treating provider, um, and asking them for an updated letter. Typically, in a documentation letter, uh, colleges and universities are looking for the diagnosis, the relationship between the doctor and the patient, um, i.e., how long they've been treated, 
medications, indicated um, functional limitations, and occasionally we may be interested in their recommendations for accommodations. Um, documentation for learning disability or certain other kinds of disabilities may be in the form of neuropsychological evaluation or a psychoeducational evaluation. If the student of non-traditional age has one, but it's several years old, they may be able to get retested. Certainly they can if they want to pay for it. We know that's not um, an inexpensive venture, but they should also inquire as to whether or not, especially if they're at a larger university, if there is retesting available at no cost through the university. Um, that's the case for UMass Boston, for example. There's a long waiting list. It takes a semester or so but we can help students get reevaluated so that their documentation is updated. Um, so that's one thing to consider as well. But even if their documentation is on the older side or they're confused about it, to echo Kristen again, they should still reach out, have an appointment. Um, the process for college accommodations is similar-ish to the process or similar enough to the process of employment accommodations. It's really all about the interactive process documentation is a part of that, but so is the student's narrative about their own experience. So that's a place for them to begin. Anyone else want to add to the, on that topic? I would just add going off of the um, narrative that they're telling about themselves is I always think you know, I realize that therapy is not always accessible to everyone. However, once you are on a college campus, you should have access to at least some mental health support. And I think um, I'm a licensed professional counselor, so I'm obviously very biased. But I think that counseling and therapy can be a really, really great place to practice, work on, build those self-awareness skills and those self-advocacy skills so that you feel confident and capable when you are ready to meet with accessible education or accessibility services um, so that you've had time to work on those skills as well. Because you're going to want those for lots and lots and lots of different areas in your life. Um, so I think that that can be really helpful as well if you have access to, to meet with a professional to talk through some of that. Great. Thanks. And I just want to pause here also to, to thank all of our panelists for joining. We have three colleges uh, represented as well as uh, other members of the top college consultants team, uh, Lisa, Alicia, and Jenny. And uh, feel free when you um, jump on, make a comment to let folks know where you're from or anything about your background or specialties. So looks like we might have another question here. Uh, um, yes. Interested in learning more about the type of support that might be provided for students on the spectrum that have difficulty with auditory comprehension and expressive speech. Um, and uh, I know that Kelsey uh, in particular has autism experience, but I think all three of you have some expertise. So if anyone wants to respond to Eric's question. I'm happy to start. That is Great. my thing. Um, so, I mean, it, it is very individualized to the student. So it's very much, you know, when I'm meeting and I have a bunch of autistic students that I just recently met with who have, you know, expressed worries about both of these things. Um, and so it's really, you know, I really sit down and try to talk with them about like, you know, how does this look in the classroom? How does this look while testing? or whatever it is, and based on, you know, what they share with me, I, I always tell people I don't expect them to be an expert in accommodations. That's my job, because I have a lot of students like, I've never had accommodations before, I'm not sure what to ask for. Uh, I just need people to be an expert in their experience and to be able to share that with me so that I can match them up. So there's lots of different creative ways you can address specifically you know, auditory comprehension and expressive speech. You know, it may be an accommodation about making sure all instructions are provided in writing, or perhaps they have a supplemental note taker so that if they feel like they might have missed something that was just being shared verbally, they have an, a, an addition set, additional set of notes that they can refer to. Um, for expressive speech, you know, sometimes that depends, that will require working with faculty. Some faculty are open to allowing you know presentations in multiple formats maybe somebody records it instead of having to do it live or there's an alternative to be able to do 
a slightly different assignment. Um, so part of the interactive process is also not only with the student, but also working with the faculty, particularly for certain accommodations, because you want to make sure we're not fundamentally altering the course of study and education. Um, but you, a lot of times you'll find, at least at Agnes Scott, the faculty are really, really wonderful and flexible and want to work with their students so they're successful. Um, so I can't, I can't just give you like a list of five accommodations, unfortunately, for that. But you know that that's really why your service provider in accessible education is there, is to be able to take what you're sharing with them and be and match those up with accommodations that are going to address the barriers that you experience, regardless of what they are. Thanks. Anyone else want to chime in on this one? Yeah, so I'd just like to piggyback off what Kelsey said. I think um, I really love the idea of sort of matching their experience with, with what we have. And I think that's definitely our role. Another aspect of our role is to sort of, is to support students in sort of the general collegiate experience, right? So we have the accommodations for the classroom, but there might be different needs in the residence halls, in the student activities experiences, um, in group presentations or group work outside of the classroom. And those are areas that the disability office can really help to guide the student to get them to appropriate resources on campus as necessary and to sometimes even have sort of modeling conversations with students around specific situations and, and scenarios. Um, as she said, every student's individual, individual, their experience is individual, so we want to approach it from that perspective. But we do want to think about the entire experience because learning just doesn't just stop in the classroom. We've got more questions coming in. Does anyone else want to add to that one before we go on to the next question? Um, questions are piling up. Um, here's a great one. Many schools say they have a disability program. How do you determine if it, the program is the right fit? Well, um, at Top College Consultants, that's part of what we do is, is help match students to programs and, and colleges. And all colleges provide accommodations, disability accommodations under federal law for whatever type of disability and not just learning differences. But some, pro some colleges have services that go above and beyond that, like a learning support program or an autism support program. And it's important to dive deeper to see what do those programs entail? Uh, how much do they cost? Uh, what's the process for becoming admitted to that program? It's typically a separate pr process for getting into the college. Uh, what is the qualifications of the staff? Who else is going to be in the program? Um, so we spend a lot of time getting to know the students and a lot of time touring colleges to see what a good fit is going to be. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to tour a whole lot during the pandemic, but um, normally I would do a lot of touring. Uh, so that's a Really important question. That's just the tip of the iceberg of an answer. I'll let someone else chime in on that one. I would say begin by knowing the difference between a disability program and a disability services office, if there is one, and, and certainly there are. There are lots of colleges, um, including right here in Massachusetts that offer um, like Dean College and Curry College that offer programs for students with disabilities that are meant to be support programs, typically academic support within a, a traditional college environment. They may have programming associated, community building sorts of things. So it is an additional fee on top of tuition. So are you looking for a disability program that has a kind of wraparound support, some community aspect to it and so forth? Or if you are looking at simply a disability services office, um, as Eric mentioned, every disability services office is offering what's called reasonable accommodations under the ADA. Uh, so there's a pretty similar process from office to office, uh, receiving documentation, having the interactive process, a meeting, a couple of meetings, implementation of um, accommodations and so forth. Some questions to ask for disability services offices might be, what is the process and protocol? Um, what other things might you recommend to a student? Do you have things in addition to accommodations, such as academic coaching, um, peer mentors, things of that nature? Um, I might also ask, as Eric said, the size of the staff and what's the size of their population? 
we can assume that 10 to 15 percent of any given college population is registered with that college's disability services office roughly uh 10 to 12 percent maybe and so what is the population of of that university or college's disability services office that's always a good thing to know as well thanks and um Again, there, there are different kinds of programs. There are learning support programs for students with all kinds of learning differences and autism support programs specifically for students on the spectrum, which I have an extensive list on, on the Top College Consultants website. Anybody else want to jump in on, on this question uh, before we go on to the next question? I would just add, you know, thinking about how more broadly about how disability is seen on the college campus. You know, when you are on a tour, do the tour guides bring up the disability services office? Are things like the autism program mentioned? Um, do, is it pointed out on the tour? That sort of thing to sort of just give you sort of a vibe of how integrated and, you know, is disability seen as like an important part of diversity on the campus or is it not really talked about and you have to be the one asking a lot of questions about that. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind too, just to sort of get a sense of how it is integrated in with the rest of the campus community or not. Great. Thanks. Looks like Rosie from Cape Cod just joined. Thanks for joining. Um, Here's a great question from Drew. At what point in the application process do the panelists recommend sharing learning challenges and or desired accommodations? Are there reasons not to share? Um, I just want to touch on a couple of quick points. Uh, anybody else is willing to uh, welcome to jump in. Um, it's not exactly an answer to the question, but I, I really encourage families to explore disability services and support programs during the college search process, early on, when you're looking at colleges, not after, not waiting until after you've committed to a college to see if it's a good fit um, in terms of disability services and accommodations. So uh, you can research it early on, you can meet with disability services, even while you're doing the college tours. And that is not the same as having disclosed to admissions that you have a disability. Uh, just because you've talked with disability services doesn't mean that, dis that admissions knows that. You certainly can talk about it during the admissions process. It's completely optional. Uh, there are certain situations when I think it can be helpful to explain something on the transcript or application that might otherwise be confusing. And uh, when students feel their disability is a strong part of their, an important part of their identity, sometimes they want to share that, but it is completely optional. Um, once you've committed to a college, I, I also encourage families to students to approach disability services even before classes start. Get your accommodations lined up to um, you know, find out what you're going to need to communicate to professors and so on. Uh, but that's uh, I've talked plenty, so I'll let someone else take a turn. An important point on that, Eric, is that admissions offices don't necessarily tell us um, who is coming through who has a disability. And so if you disclose something in your admissions packet, you should not assume that the Disability Services Office is aware of you um, and is going to reach out and connect with you. That's probably one of the biggest differences between the high school experience and the collegiate experience that somebody touched upon um, earlier is that students actually have to come, identify, seek us out. We don't know that you're here. We are excited you're here, but we don't know that you're here and we can't start working with you until you come and, and ask to see one of us. Um, so I also agree, come visit us with, on a tour, set something up. We're more than happy to have a conversation on the phone. Some months are busier than others, so be patient with us. Um, but we're definitely excited to talk to you and to share what we can offer. And that may, very well may skew where you decide to apply. And a quick uh, addition to, to Kirsten's comment um, on, on disability services not knowing about students. Most students in college do not disclose their disabilities. Um, so obviously, if they don't disclose, they don't get accommodations. If they don't get accommodations, their prospects for advancing and graduating are not as good. And unfortunately, the graduation rates are lower. So I really encourage students to disclose, make use of all the resources available at college. There are so many great resources 
and many students don't take advantage of them. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too. I think that if you're applying to a program, um, a specific disability support program that's, um, that is not disability services, there may be two applications involved. I think you mentioned that, Eric. But if we're just talking about registering for accommodations, um, you could, as Eric said, there may be um, valuable reasons or valid reasons for you to mention that in the admissions process. You really don't need to. You can protect your own confidentiality and your own privacy by going through the admissions process. And then I always tell students, think of registering with the Disability Services Office and keeping that record updated. Um, every school has a different process from semester to semester of how your accommodation letters will get to your professors. Think of it as your whole kind of um, preparing for the semester task list. You have your schedule, you have your backpack, you have your bookstore trip, all of that kind of stuff. And you need to make sure that you've done what you need to do semester by semester at the Disability Services Office. For example, at UMass, we require, we require, excuse me, we require that you activate your accommodations every semester by going into our database, um, activating them, and therefore giving us permission to send accommodation letters directly to professors. So it's part of a student's self-advocacy, and it's part of a student's keeping their own experience um, uh, going by making sure that they've touched base with our database and with our center every semester. Um, and so coming back to Kirsten's point, when you have applied somewhere, um, once you've been admitted, you can then go and should go to the Disability Services Office, go through the process, and they will set some accommodations uh, for you. On that point, accommodations are never retroactive. So if you decided in September or August, I maybe don't need them, maybe I won't even use them, and then get yourself into hot water in October, November, you can still come and have accommodations set, but they are not retroactive. So get your accommodations, preferably before the first week of school if you can, as soon as you possibly can, so that right from the start, your professors have those letters, understand your accommodations, assist in implementing them, and then you don't have to use them. You can have them in your back pocket, but if you don't have them, you can't use them. So always make sure that you're proactive, get yourself there, and this is probably self-evident, but disability services offices always protect your confidentiality and privacy. We don't cross-talk with other departments, so we wouldn't call admissions and say, um, does Jane Smith have this, did you know that Jane Smith has this uh, in her record? It's completely confidential within the scope of the office and not without the scope of the office. Thanks, Allison. Um, just to clarify or, or add to what you said on uh, not being retroactive, that means if a student fails a test, you can't go back to the professor and say, oh, hold on, I should be entitled to extra time because I have a disability. That's why you want to line all that up before classes start in, in your first year. Um, great questions. Uh, and Lisa and Alicia, you're obviously welcome to jump in anytime too. I just want to, um, note a couple of comments in the chat here from Emmanuel Reed. Uh, Greetings from Jeju Island in South Korea. I'm head of academic support in the high school division of an American Curriculum International School. Uh, we might have questions for you too. Um, I don't know what time it is there, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, another LinkedIn user said, love this, wish I had this support growing up. And another LinkedIn user said, my name is Jacob and I teach, uh, here I'll, I'll show it. I teach job seekers and small businesses with disabilities how to identify opportunities outside of their network by utilizing the LinkedIn algorithm as well as content creation based on one subject matter expertise and targeting slash adding value to decision makers behind any job in the world. I'm also a person with disability. So welcome Jacob and anyone with a disability or with a child with a disability. Uh, again, we welcome your questions. Anyone else want to comment on, on the questions so far or the most recent question before we go on to the next question? So there was a question about testing. Let me just scroll back up. Thank you, panelists, about testing required. Can you speak more on the evaluations for education, Denver, Colorado, grant funding for testing is available. Are there certain test names that can be more helpful because they're more current? I, 
I think the testing depends on what the disability is and what you're trying to establish. But I think the college folks could speak better to that than I could. Kelsey, I can't see if you're going to, so I don't want to like. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll go I'll, once you're done. I'll follow no. you. You go first. Oh, you sure? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I can speak most obvious. I guess I'll reintroduce myself really quickly because people are, I think, coming in halfway through. But my name is Kelsey Bolke. I'm the assistant director for accessible education at Agnes Scott College, which is a tiny private liberal arts college in Atlanta, Georgia. Prior to that, I was working at the Emory Autism Center, supporting primarily um, autistic adults, autistic college students. So that's where a lot of my expertise lies. Um, so I, I can't, it, you know, colleges are sort of, and universities are different depending on what specifically they want for documentation. I can say at Agnes Scott, we're actually superly duperly flexible. We work with a lot of students that do not have um, disposable income to be able to afford, you know, $1,500 tests. So we're quite flexible. However, there are specific things that we might require a specific test for. One thing that comes to mind is we require four semesters of a foreign language. And some students, whether it's dyslexia or processing disorder, really, really struggle with foreign language. And so they can get very specific testing done in order to get an accommodation for that to be able to take alternative courses instead of a foreign language. But we, we require that specifically because it's a graduation requirement. So being able to make changes to graduation requirements requires a pretty high level of documentation. But overall, you know, I don't think that there, you know, there are gold standard tests for different things, but I, I think for the most part, disability services offices um, just like to see some sort of testing. Obviously you don't wanna print out like an online quiz that you took that says, hey, I think you might have autism or something like that. But, you know, we, we don't have a list of tests in our office that we're looking to make sure people took um, or evaluations, except for those really specific, um, like graduation requirement exemptions, things like that. So I'm gonna echo pretty much exactly what Kelsey says. At Tufts University, we really don't have a list or even a required age of the documentation. And there's conversations that um, we're having right now in the disability services professional world around what that looks like and, and how specifically we want to be with those requirements. Um, again, everything is individualized. So a person's journey is, you know, where they've been and what they've been through is, is really important. When we're looking at accommodations and what makes sense, there's three things that we're looking for, three. Sorry, I can hold my fingers up at late in the afternoon. Um, the first is we do need some type of diagnostic documentation, but that's kind of like as far as it goes in terms of specifics. If you have a neuropsych or a psychoeducational evaluation, ideally that was done more recently, um, that is a starting point for sure. Um, if you are navigating a mental health disability, mental health changes often quite frequently. So some institutions might ask for updated information on a more regular basis than they might for, for something like a dis, uh, disability like dyslexia or something like that. Um, chronic health is another area that we're seeing an increase in rise in students with disabilities. Again, that's something that changes um, over time and it can also change with treatment. So we might ask for a letter from the physician. That being said, while we are open to a lot of things, we are also in some ways um, Sometimes we play detective in that we can we recognize if there's been information sent on a, um, um, a letterhead that maybe matches the last name of the student, um, or there are certain providers out there that we you know know maybe are not quite legit. So we might we might ask some more questions. So the first piece is we need that documentation. The second piece, though, that weighs pretty equally in terms of our decision is that intake interview the chance for the student to explain to us their history with their experiences, their concerns about transitioning to college, um, what worked well and where were some barriers. And that really weighs a lot because, you know, we can see in a course of a day, six or seven students with the same diagnoses, but their journey has been very different, even, term, even in terms of like when they came to that diagnosis and what that meant for their educational path. So that's really important. And then the third piece that we can look at, which I think weighs a little bit less, is our interaction with the student. 
So if I have a student that comes in that's saying they have dysgraphia and they need to be able to use a computer um, to, to handle, you know, typing and so forth, I might ask them to just, you know, take a note or something and take a look I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Right, so it's sort of how we interact with the student and what that experience is. Um, but I would think that most offices are, are a little bit more open with what their standards are in terms of what kind of tests that we're asking for or looking at and also even the age of the test. That's something that we're taking a little bit more of a wider range of flexibility on these days. We've got a whole Bunch of new questions here from Karen and Drew and Eric. So uh, let's forge ahead unless someone else wants to comment on the testing question. Uh, here's another one from Drew. Any advice from the panel on how to help a student transition to taking ownership of their learning and taking advantage of the great services many institutions offer to address learning challenges? I have concerns my son will avoid help and fly under the radar. Um, it's, that's a really good question because um, the, it's not just a matter of finding the, the services or finding the colleges that offer the great services, but getting the students to take advantage of them, to access them. So um, that's something that I run across a lot. Anybody want to jump in here? I might begin with giving your students specific tasks that must be accomplished before he arrives at school. So he should make his own appointment with disability services. He should upload or send in his own documentation. He should go to the appointment alone. Um, he should go to the financial aid office and finish the paperwork, ask a question of the registrar, contact his advisor. Um, small, small things like that, important tasks, but small things like that so that he gets used to navigating campus on his own and beginning to see the network of support systems that work closely together. Um, I would really in that case, but actually in all cases, avoid um, parental over involvement because some things that we notice, I think this will resonate with um, my other college friends on the panel is a parent who comes in and says, I will explain to you everything that my uh, student is experiencing, every diagnosis, every behavioral aspect of it, every performance issue in high school. Um, and often when that happens, the student sort of recedes into the background um, and, and loses his or her voice, but he or she can't. They are the driver of accommodations in college. And so they are the center of their own narrative and they need to be able to express and articulate that as we began by saying. So I would really encourage little tasks that must get done. You should make this call. You should make this appointment and so forth um, so that they begin getting comfortable and acclimated with these services and comfortable and acclimated um, using their voice. I echo what Allison says. Um, immensely i think that's really important the other thing i think that sometimes happens which feels very uncomfortable and i'll i'll own that is sometimes um you know we'll see students sort of at the start of the summer as they've been accepted in there you know frequently you know coming in behind their parent um so your your analogy allison where they sort of fade back is absolutely true and we might get everything set up and then once the semester starts the students decided not to utilize their accommodations for whatever reason maybe they forgot or um, they got involved in the campus experience and that was really fun and the thing that's hard to swallow is that's their right and so um, it's not uncommon and i'm sure allison um, and christy would or, or kelsey would would agree with this it's not uncommon for us to be quite busy around midterms because what happens is it's like that last minute oh my gosh i forgot to ask or they took an exam because they thought maybe they didn't need the services anymore. They had had everything covered and it didn't go so well. And as Eric said earlier, we can't retroactively fit that, fix that moment, but we can use it as a teaching moment. We can use it as an opportunity to plan for accommodations use in, in the future, but also to get the student to the right resources on campus. Maybe that's tutoring, maybe that's coaching of some sorts, um, maybe it's connected to our friends in our counseling center. So that's actually really a good opportunity sometimes to work with students is when they're when they're in that moment they have that like uh oh um that's a great space for them to learn and to and for us to come in and, and educate um together in a collaborative effort i work with students primarily during high school um getting ready for college and 
part of getting ready for college isn't just applying to college or picking a college, uh, but it is that development of self-advocacy and independent skills. So I encourage parents to look for those opportunities to have the, the student scheduling their own appointments and stepping forward and accessing resources while they're still in high school. And one of the advantages I think of working with a consultant is the students stepping outside the family, working with another adult professional and getting used to that kind of relationship uh, that they're gonna then have in college working with, uh, whether it's a counselor, academic advisor, professor. So I, I think it's a great opportunity for students to start kind of individuating themselves and um, interacting with adult professionals. Yeah, and I just wanted to add something to that too, that I think when students are encouraged bit by bit to do things that they must do, you know, sign this application, make this appointment, I'm hopeful that it builds confidence because so much of this is really about building confidence um, to do things that they don't have to do, but that they want to, or that they are willing to try out, you know, join this club. But speaking to um, Drew's point about flying under the radar, that's something that we think a lot about. So when they are tasked with things that they have to do, we're hopeful that it builds confidence so that they encourage, are encouraged and continue to do things that they don't have to do, but would benefit from doing. And I wanted to also touch on something you just said, Eric, about developing relationships outside of the family circle that are also supportive. Um, I think that sort of confidence building that we're trying to um, encourage between high school and college is also something that will serve them well when they're in the employment world. As I said earlier, employment accommodations, that process generally mirrors the college process more so than college accommodations mirror the high school process. So this is all good training for future experiences in terms of independence, confidence, and self-advocacy. I wanted just to add really quickly, I'm so sorry, um, that it would be my hope, I, I work with high school students, and so what, as a counselor, what I would really try to encourage students that have disabilities to do is to take ownership of their disability early on and working with that case carrier to make sure that they can, you know, be very aware what they're struggling with, what their strengths are, what their limitations are, and getting them used to taking ownership of that as early as 10th grade, because that's really well where the packaging of the college process starts. So that by the time they are that senior or they finally do uh, enter in college as a freshman, it's already kind of a part of their, you know, their college de collegiate identity already to just kind of be able to have that self-efficacy to advocate for themselves so they're not falling under the radar. So there's also a question here from, from Liam, uh, what advice or, or um, tips do you have for adults seeking to return to college after many years off from academics? I think we actually touched on that earlier. So um, let's go back to another question. Uh, Liam, you might want to check out the recording once it's available. Um, let's go up to a question from Eric on, uh, Question about admissions. What advice would you have for a student on the spectrum that is working to navigate the admissions process in that their disability may affect, impact their essay writing abilities, SAT scores, etc.? And that's certainly something that we see all the time. Most of the students that I work with have disabilities, and um, we're lucky to be at a time when most of the time uh, SATs are optional um, for most colleges at the moment. <clears throat> that wasn't always the case but certainly that it still plays into the essay and other issues. So who wants to comment on this one? Um, so I would start by saying that, you know, that as Eric has mentioned a little bit previously, that's part of what we do here um, at Top College Consultants is, is navigating those pieces, helping students and families navigate those pieces of the admissions process to address where um, like you said, essay writing, SAT scores, and even college lists, developing those college lists, keeping in mind the disability offices, the accommodations, what all is available at a, at a specific university. And going forward with that, are there pieces of the application that need to be addressed in say the additional um, essay section that need to be addressed? Well, this is the reason why say the SAT scores are not um, being submitted, or this is the reason why um, the there was a there was a shift in a in a grade at, at one point, um, and so really thinking about you know when you are working with a college consultant, whether that's through your high school or an independent educational consultant, 
um, working on those pieces with them to, to help you navigate it with your student and, and with the families as well. Anyone else want to comment on that one? <clears throat> Another question just came in from Marlena. Is there a resource for new students to get an idea of what comp kinds of accommodations they can ask for? Sometimes it's a struggle to know what can be asked for or what would be helpful. Excellent question. Uh, you typically don't find a li comprehensive list on a college's website. Here's all the accommodations you can get. Um, and there's some that are, I think, intentionally not advertised, like some students can get a single room in the residence hall um, for medical reasons or issues relating to social interactions. Um, but because colleges, especially those in near urban areas, are can be short on space, that's not something that's necessarily promoted, um, except at a couple of colleges that I know of. But that, that is an example of one that is there, but you wouldn't know about it if you didn't know. So um, who wants to tackle this one? I'd say you can begin by looking at your high school experience. What accommodations did you have in high school? And you could ask the reverse question too, which is what kinds of things did you have in high school that may not be available at college? Um, whether or not you've already thought about that, that's an important thing to consider. There are certain kinds of accommodations in high school that don't translate to college. Um, there are still plenty of supports, um, but they're not necessarily the same or analogous accommodation that you may have had in high school. So it's worth thinking about that. Another way to look at it um, is to look at the areas in which the struggle is most profound. So is it in the class listening to lectures? Is it um, getting homework assignments done on time? Is it taking a test within a, a constrained amount of time? What is the barrier is the question that, that is going to be asked uh, during your intake meeting or your registration meeting. Um, and what kinds of things do you think can assist with those areas of struggle? Um, do you need more time on tests? Do you struggle with? And you don't even necessarily need to ask for specific accommodations. You can, but you can also just go through the interactive process, have the conversation with the professional in the office, tell them the things that you are struggling with, talk to them about your experience with your diagnosis and your disability, and they will have a sense of what would be useful to you. Also, there are some colleges and universities that provide lists of available accommodations. Um, UMass Boston does. You know, I think in our conversations, we have the caveat of all of these are not available to every single person, but this is an idea of what might be possible for you. So I hope that's helpful. I stand corrected. Apparently there are lists out there. <laughs> The only thing I would add to that is that accommodations, what happens and what happens in that in initial intake, the decisions that are made are not necessarily static for the entire collegiate experience for a student. So things change, courses change, um, sometimes disabilities change. So that's why we encourage students to check back on a regular basis. Um, and as one of my panelists um, had said earlier, it depends on the institution in terms of what that frequency looks like. At Tufts, we do the same thing where we only provide accommodations for each semester. And we do that deliberately because what we want students to do is to check back in and be like, hey, things are good. You know, I don't need anything else or, you know, maybe to raise a flag about a particular course that's coming up um, that they're concerned about. And then we can have, again, a smaller interactive process about that experience, their concerns, and determine if they need additional resources that maybe fall outside of the Disability Services Office or if they need specific accommodations for a specific course. So it's never really stagnant. It can be. Um, we can see a student once and only once if their accommodations are good for the rest of their experience. But we, we really do like to see students on a more regular basis to know how things are going and if anything needs to be adjusted. I also just really want to reiterate what Allison was sharing about being able to talk about what the barriers are. I have a lot of students that come to me, especially those who received accommodations in K through 12, who just say, like, I had this, 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 then this, and this, and, and that's what I want in college. And I, my question is always like, okay, why? What, what is the challenge that those are addressing? What's the barrier? And students tend to have a hard time sort of getting at what is going on in the class that's difficult for me. 
Um, and the reason that, you know, I, I really want to hear about the barriers and their experience is, and also why we don't like publish a list of all the accommodations is because just the other day I created an entirely new accommodation for a student because the barrier that they were experiencing, we didn't have an existing accommodation that met that need. Um, and so that's why it's really important and helpful for us to hear what is going on. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but none of us expect students to be experts in accommodations. That's our job. Um, we just need the student to be really honest and clear about what their experience is as a student so that we can meet those needs. Um, just one more thing to, to add uh, somewhat to, to this point, uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, when we think about accommodations in, in high school, we're thinking mostly focused on uh, in the classroom. But when you're thinking about accommodations in college, there's also accommodations that need to be thought about outside of the classroom. Um, you know, thinking about are there housing accommodations, dining accommodations, things outside of the classroom. So really also thinking about those pieces as well. Excellent point. Certainly students with mobility issues are going to may, may need accommodations throughout their uh, the campus. Um, here's something that I don't know if it's the elephant in the room, but nobody's asked yet, how has the pandemic affected all this? So um, apart from, you know, some of the comments about admissions, Anything you want to say as far as sort of what's new, what's changing, um, how colleges are pivoting and adapting? Well, our national um, professional organization that we are all a part of is AHEAD, Association for Higher Education and Disability. And your guidance recently is that the post-pandemic, if we are in the post-pandemic, um, time is, is a time of, of evolving policy. Um, so we are experiencing a lot of requests for an accommodation that we are not able to grant, which is students who want to continue their education fully remote. Um, UMass Boston has decided to be a fully on-campus uh, experience in the fall for all students. Uh, they are offering, we are offering some remote classes and some hybrid classes to facilitate those sorts of requests, but to remain fully online um, as a student is not an option and it's not an accommodation for our institution at this point in time. It's a very difficult conversation to have because there are lots of mitigating or, aggra or aggravating factors, I think is a better way to put that, students who are living with um, an immunocompromised person or are one themselves. So there are some difficult decisions for students to make. Um, coming to, uh, for example, UMass Boston in the fall means that you've committed to being on campus for your classes, uh, for most of your classes. And so is that the right decision for you at this point in time? Um, we've had students asking in the uh, Disability Services Office for that as an accommodation. It's not an accommodation. Um, that's the current guidance. That's the current um, uh experience, I think, at, at more colleges than not, it remains to be seen whether or not that continues. So we're developing a policy for uh, long haul COVID because that's now covered under the ADA. And similar to what Kirsten was talking about, it, that in particular is a very semester by semester experience. So we ask for documentation from a medical provider, um, and then we'll ask for renewed documentation for the new semester because it's just such an ongoing an unpredictable experience for people. So it certainly is a huge part of the conversation and evolving. I'm just gonna put a, a related question that just came up uh, from Emmanuel in South, at a school in South Korea. So it's, it's quite related to the question about the pandemic and folks are welcome to answer the general question or this one specifically. What types of accommodations are being provided for students with disabilities during virtual learning at the colleges of the people on the panel. This is something that's been coming up a lot recently with parents and students. It's something I've heard a lot about too. Uh, how can you get the same accommodations when you're not physically at school? You don't have that resource teacher or what have you uh, to you know, look over your shoulder. Anyone wanna to touch on this one specifically or we'll go back to yeah. the general question. I, I can start on it. Um, I think, you know, to echo what Allison was saying is this is an evolving experience for all of us, um, depending on what 
position you're coming from. Um, I think, you know, for some students, being online actually was a better, a better space for them. The ability to have less, you know, personal interaction um, and to, you know, compute and, and to work remotely. Um, and I think as we go forward, we're learning from these experiences as well and trying to figure out how we can best provide services. So in my office, for example, we will continue to offer intake appointments on Zoom for some students because that is just a preferred method for them. It's also in some places conven more convenient. They can't physically get to us. There's, there's barriers there. With regards to accommodations online, for the most part, everything translated over. Colleges and universities still had an obligation to their students to provide sources, uh, resources, but a lot of times they were online through online meetings. Sometimes there are asynchronous resources that were listed. Um, Extended time could still be done in courses. It just might be a matter of us, not the student, but us working with the faculty member to figure out how to do that in the platform with which they are teaching. Um, note taking was still an option. In some cases, we actually saw a, de a decrease in the need for accommodations because professors were now audio recording or video recording with captions um, their courses and making them available to all students um, either before or even after the class. So that was really great. And in fact, we've actually seen a movement from some college faculty who have stumbled into these universal design for learning strategies that, that um, are you know, traditionally accommodations but are actually beneficial for a wider group of people and have every intention of continuing utilizing them. So accommodations can continue. Um, if a student is concerned or not sure, they absolutely should reach out to the Disability Services Office to try to figure it out. Some of them take a little creative brainstorming, um, but just being in the online environment does not necessarily preclude them from using, utilizing and, and getting access to the accommodations that they need. Yes, I'd like to second that. Uh, most accommodations have actually translated over, including things like academic coaching, which for us is not an accommodation per se, but it's a service that our office offers, executive functioning, coaching for students who are registered with us. Um, but as Kirsten said, extra time on exams. Um, and an interesting benefit of online classes during the pandemic has been what Kirsten mentioned, professors providing copies of notes um, prior to instruction, which is an accommodation that we offer, recording lectures. So there actually has been many layers of built-in support that mirror accommodations in some cases. Um, Zoom meetings and so forth, um, assistive technology. I think many people have learned more about assistive technology and what features are available on their laptops and phones. So certainly accommodations have translated in the online environment. I think the Marine Corps motto is uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. And that's what we are all doing throughout the pandemic and post-pandemic period. Um, and on that note, you heard both Kirsten and Kelsey use the word creative. And I think that's something to take heart in when you're looking at accommodations, either for yourself or your child, that there is always a layer of creativity and flexibility within what we would call reasonable accommodations. I've, I've noticed also in the disability community as a whole uh, on social media and in the news, really uh, a lot of commentary on how the pandemic has played out because, for example, working from home is something that a lot of folks have been requesting for years because of certain disabilities and, and in some cases haven't been denied from their employers and now all of a sudden everyone's doing it. and, and folks with disabilities are saying, well, you know, if, if you could do it all along, how come you couldn't do it for us before? So in some ways, you know, going back to what Kirsten was saying, I know Kirsten's a big fan of universal design, which you're welcome to expand on. You know, the uh, pandemic has really opened up opportunities for us to see how education can happen differently, uh, whether it's recorded lectures, um, studying remotely, it can benefit uh, people who are uh, have diverse learning needs. Not everyone has the same learning needs and offering more options opens up education to more people. Anyone else want to comment on pandemic related topics? We're running close to the time um, or any additional comments to any of the questions that have come up that didn't get, uh, didn't have time for before. 
Um, Eric, you mentioned um, universal design, and I know we know what that is, but I was wondering if one of the uh, representatives could expand for the audience what that looks like in real time. I could take it. Kristen? <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a feeling it was going to be you. I wrote a book uh, on it. Yeah, um, Kristen literally wrote the book on this. So. Great. Thank um, you. Yeah, so universal design is a concept that is founded in architecture. Um, in fact, I just did a keynote on this today, um, where the idea was that we want to design buildings to be accessible by the broadest range of users from the beginning. So instead of designing a building that has a set of stairs, for example, maybe the building has a, a gentle sloping ramp, right, so that people can get in it in through the front door. Um, and it's been translated to higher education, to education in general, but to higher education through the concept of universal design for learning. And this is asking faculty to really think about how they're asking students to engage with their courses, how they are, are instructing, and how they're assessing. And what's great about universal design for learning is a lot of times it takes a specific accommodation, for example, like closed captioning, which was designed for a very particular group of people, the deaf and hard of hearing, and yet it's used widely for a whole bunch of different reasons. Maybe English is a second language. Maybe um, you know, you're know you trying to watch TV while somebody else is trying to sleep. Maybe you're out and about and it's just easier to read it. So it's taking these accommodations that, we're, that us in the disability field are always advocating for and pushing for and making them more universally accessible with the idea that there are students who will not come and self-identify, who may not qualify, and yet would also benefit from a little extra time to take their exam um, or having a copy of those notes. Um, what's great about the, the concept of universal design is it will dra drastically reduce the need for students to request some accommodations. It won't limit it, uh, eliminate the need for accommodations, but it will drastically reduce them. Wonderful. Thanks, Kirsten, and thanks, uh, Lisa, for bringing that up. So uh, this has been wonderful very informative, I think, for all of us. Uh, I really appreciate uh, both the college uh, disability folks and the top college consultants folks for joining and everyone in the audience. Great questions. Um, this will be available for as a recording for anyone who was not able to be here tonight. And um, panelists, you're welcome to stay on. I'm going to end the broadcast in a second, but uh, Getting lots of thank yous here. So, um, thanks for your questions. Thanks for showing up. And we'll see you another time.